What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. We're continuing on with our cardiovascular assessment and electrocardiogram like a boss series and we're going to be discussing premature complexes. Before we begin, I want you to take a look up here on the right side of your screen. You're going to see two different sets of stoplights. Our first set of stoplight is going to tell us about our rhythm. Is it a good rhythm? Is it a rhythm we should be cautious about? Or is it a lethal rhythm? Those not really good rhythms. And our next one is going to be either a green person letting us know that we can play our monopoly game, collect our $200 and keep going, or it needs to be red, stop, we need to do something about this before it gets worse. So the first premature complex we're gonna discuss is premature atrial complex rhythms. So the rate is usually between 60 to 100 beats per minute, and the rhythm is irregular. P waves should be upright, as they are regularly, and the PR interval as well as the QRS interval should both be normal. The definition for this rhythm is beats from non-sinus origination. P wave shape is dependent on the location of the origination, and PACs occur before the expected sinus beat, and they can occur randomly or in a pattern. So premature atrial complex causes can be digitalis toxicity, caffeine or tobacco use, you could have low potassium as well as low magnesium present, our COPD patients can exhibit this, as well as our heart failure patients. So what do we do intervention-wise? Well, premature atrial complexes are not always felt by our patients. If they are felt, they may be perceived as palpitations or even a skipped beat. In order to correct this, we have to identify the underlying cause of the PAC and really figure out if it's a concern issue or if it's just something that's randomly happening. Next, we're going to move on to premature junctional complex rhythms. So the rate is really dependent on what the underlying rhythm is. Of course, the rhythm is irregular because this is a premature complex. And P waves, just like with our junctional rhythms, are either absent, inverted, preceding, or following the QRS. The PR interval regularly will be normal, 0.12 to 0.2 seconds. If a premature complex is present, then it'll be less than 0.12 seconds. And the QRS itself, of course, will still be normal, less than that 0.12 seconds. The definition for this rhythm is ectopic impulses originating around the atrioventricular node. QRS may be preceded by an inverted P wave due to retrograde conduction or may not be seen at all. So premature junctional complex causes can be digitalis toxicity, hypoxemia, excessive caffeine or amphetamine intake, myocardial infarction or ischemia, congestive heart failure, and hypoxia. So interventions, just like with our premature atrial complexes, we want to correct the underlying factors if the premature junctional complexes are causing concern. Next, we're going to take a look at our premature ventricular complex rhythms. These are going to be a little bit more involved. So to begin, the rate is really dependent on what the underlying rhythm is. The rhythm itself should be irregular because we're having these premature complexes. And P waves are going to be lost in each PVC. So if we're losing those P waves in each PVC, then our PR interval won't exist with these PVCs. And the QRS interval is usually wide, they're ugly, they're big, just like with our ventricular rhythms, they're going to be greater than that 0.12 seconds. The definition for this is an ectopic impulse originating from the ventricles. T waves are in the opposite direction of the QRS and has a disguised ST segment followed by a pause before the next beat appears. So causes with our premature ventricular complexes include digitalis toxicity, emotional stress can bring these on, ingestion of stimulants such as caffeine, tobacco, and alcohol, ingestion of medications, especially with our epinephrines, um, low potassium, low calcium, and myocardial ischemia. So treatment is dependent on the frequency of PVCs. So isolated or non-ventricular tachycardia PVCs are not frequently treated except when they become symptomatic. 
If they do become symptomatic and we do need to treat them, the first thing we can do is oxygenation. We can provide oxygen if the oxygenation is inadequate, less than 94%. Beta blockers, in this case, we would be using metoprolol or atenolol with these patients. And we also can correct electrolyte imbalances if that is the underlying cause of the PVCs. It's important to note Frequent PVCs and acute coronary syndrome indicates the need for more aggressive treatment with oxygen, nitroglycerin, morphine, and reperfusion therapy for myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction. So let's take a look at our beta blockers. So we administer beta blockers to patients with suspected myocardial infarction and unstable angina without contraindications. They also work well with fibronolytic therapy to reduce non-fatal reinfarctions and ischemia. They also reduce myocardial ischemia and damage in acute myocardial infarction patients with elevated heart rates, blood pressure, or both. So when we're looking at the dosing, for metoprolol, we're going to give 5 mg IV slowly at 5 minute intervals for a total of 15 mg. You want to follow with oral medications of 50 mg PO, titrating until we get the optimal effect. When it comes to atenolol, our initial dose will be 5 mg IV over 5 minutes. After 10 minutes, we want to provide a second dose of 5 mg IV over 5 minutes again. And after that next 10 minutes, if they are tolerating it, we want to begin oral dosing with 50 mg PO titrating until we get the optimal effect. So considerations with beta blockers, we do not want to give to patients with ST elevation myocardial infarctions if the following presentation is seen, such as heart failure, low cardiac output, or increased risk of cardiogenic shock. Additional contraindications can include a PR interval greater than 0.24 seconds, second degree heart block, third degree complete heart block, active asthma, reactive airway disease, severe bradycardia, a systolic blood pressure of less than 100, early aggressive beta blocker treatment can be detrimental in hemodynamically unstable patients, so we don't want to provide it to them, and concurrent calcium channel blocking administration can cause severe hypotension, bradycardia, and even heart blocks. So when we have premature ventricular complexes taking place, it's only beneficial for us to find out whether it is of a right ventricular origination or a left ventricular origination. So with right PVCs, you'll see ectopic beats that initiate in the right ventricle causing a negative deflection in lead V1 versus left PVCs, you're gonna see that ectopic beat that originates in the left ventricle causing a positive deflection in lead one. So PVCs can occur in healthy individuals regardless of age, but are more common in older adults with high blood pressure and heart disease. With our left premature ventricular complexes, they are more often associated with some form of heart disease, whereas our right premature ventricular complexes are common with our much more healthy hearts. Ischemic heart disease can produce left PVCs. So now we're gonna take a look at bigeminy versus trigeminy premature ventricular complexes. So again, the rate, the rhythm, P waves, PR interval, and QRS intervals are all gonna be the same. With our bigeminy premature ventricular complexes, they are defined as one normal beat followed by one uniform PVC. PVCs are initiated from the same location in the ventricles with identical QRS complexes called unifocal. Just like with our bigeminy PVCs, we're gonna look at our trigeminy PVCs. So the definition for trigeminy premature ventricular complexes are two normal beats followed by one uniform PVC. PVCs are initiated from the same location in the ventricles with identical QRS complexes called unifocal. Lastly, we're gonna look at couplet premature ventricular complexes. So again, 
Everything is still the same as with all of our PVCs, but in this situation, PVCs can occur as two consecutive beats within a normal rhythm. So after looking at these multi-form premature ventricular complexes, what really can cause a lot of these issues? So emotional stress can actually cause a lot of strain on your heart. Ingestion of stimulants such as caffeine, tobacco, and alcohol. Ingestion of medications such as our epinephrine that we discussed earlier. Hypocalcemia, hypokalemia, uh, digitalis toxicity, and myocardial ischemia. Overall, isolated and non-ventricular tachycardia PVCs are not frequently treated except when symptoms are present. So if symptoms are present for these multiform premature ventricular complexes, what do we do? Well, if oxygenation is not adequate, we're going to provide oxygen if they've got an oxygen saturation less than 94%. Beta blockers such as our metoprolol and our tenolol can also work. We can correct those electrolyte imbalances, our calcium as well as our potassium, and antiarrhythmics are also another option. It's also important to note, when you see frequent PVCs in acute coronary syndrome, it indicates the need for more aggressive treatment with oxygen, nitroglycerin, morphine, and reperfusion therapy for myocardial ischemia and infarction. So we've had a lot of discussion about PVCs and sometimes they're concerned and sometimes they're not. So let's talk about when premature ventricular complexes should worry you. So frequent PVCs. PVCs initiating from the same area of the ventricle is a poor sign of oxygenation. If the PVCs are identical, this indicates the foci is coming from the same ventricle. Now we're looking at runs of PVCs, three or greater. Oxygen supply decreases to the ventricles, leading to a series of rapid impulses, also known as runs. A run of three or more PVCs in succession and can be referred to as a run of ventricular tachycardia. If the run of ventricular tachycardia lasts longer than 30 seconds, this is referred to as sustained ventricular tachycardia. When we have those uniformed PVCs, we're not so much worried, but when we start to see those multifocal PVCs, that's a reason for concern. Multifocal PVCs are initiated from different foci in the ventricles and will cause the QRS complexes to differ in appearance. Severe cardiac hypoxia can cause many multifocal PVCs. This is dangerous and lethal in many situations. Lastly, we have this R on T phenomenon. So this R on T phenomenon occurs when the PVC falls on a T wave from the previous beat. Dangerous arrhythmias can occur and is a warning sign in the presence of cardiac ischemia as well as low potassium levels. I hope that this video was helpful in elevating your cardiac knowledge and helping you pass those exams like a boss. Make sure that you check out my website at www.nursechung.com where you can get copies of these resources, the PowerPoints, as well as test questions that I will be including with each one of these videos within the series. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions and make sure you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure you subscribe and make sure you turn on that notification bell. Until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I can't wait to see you all again soon. Bye.